You're listening to And hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yeh. And I'm Rira Yu. And welcome to our November 2023 mid-month book news check-in, where we go over the latest Asian American and Asian American related book and publishing news. Um, it's almost Turkey Day. Happy, um, I guess, you know, since we won't get a chance to say it, happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners who do celebrate. Hopefully y'all have a peaceful and I guess delicious time with your family or loved ones or chosen family or whoever you choose to celebrate with. Um, This will be the first Thanksgiving that I have as a, um, that's not true. My second as a married person, but first one and where my parents are actually in town for the first time in a decade. So I actually have to split between two families this year. Um, so trying to oh, figure that out. Oh, it's your first out. time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I've done that like pretty much all throughout my entire relationship with <laughs> with Dan. It's funny because uh, like, you know, parents, they ask you to, you know, what they're like, when are you getting married? When are you going to have a boyfriend, a girlfriend, blah, 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 blah. And then once you finally do, they don't realize that they have to share you with yeah. other people. <laughs> And then they get mad because they're like, why am I not your favorite set of parents? Why are you spending the holidays with these strangers? And you're like, they're not strangers. They're my in-laws. Like, Yeah. <laughs> well, for those who do not celebrate Thanksgiving, I mean, good on you. Genocide <laughs> is bad. Uh, but Native American Heritage Day is right after Thanksgiving. And also you have the capitalist holidays. You have Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Small Business Saturday. So happy shopping to people in advance. You know what was interesting? So I was in Toronto last week um, on some family business and Toronto is getting geared up for Christmas. But when I went, everything was Diwali. All the malls were geared up for Diwali, which I'm like, even the Asian holidays. I mean, we saw this. We've seen this with Lunar New Year. Even the Asian holidays have become commercialized by corporations. So, you know, nothing nothing is safe, nothing is sacred. But it's also cool to see them recognizing other holidays. It's kind of like... I mean, um, I feel like this, every holiday is going to be... There's going to be capitalism involved. In I know. It. Are we really represented if our heritage isn't exploited for capital gain? I mean, it's already exploited in our motherland country. So <laughs> might as well, right? Yeah. It's also... It's also like uh, Marvin's least favorite time of the year because people have been putting up Christmas decorations and Christmas music you know, early. I'm just I've decided this year that I'm over being mad about that. I'm just accepting it. You know, I'm still not happy about it, um, but I'll keep Thanksgiving alive in my head while I'm staring in all your Santa decorations. But, you know, at this point, you can't really fight it. Maybe this is just getting older. Maybe it's just you because I'm younger than you and I feel like I've gotten over this like way <laughs> earlier than than you have. But then again, I don't really care about uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas. I'm just not a very like after Halloween is over. That's it. It's all downhill from there. I'm like, mm. uh, <laughs> like It's not like November and December are like my worst months of, <laughs> of the year. Yeah, hopefully these holidays will will be easier on you um i guess as always good luck and know that we'll always also, be here to support you <laughs> and also good luck to those who are participating in nanorimo this year oh yeah i mean i i admire you guys i don't know how you guys can do it in november of all months but go you yeah, you guys are halfway through. So hopefully you finished half of your manuscripts and aren't procrastinating. If you're participating, let us know how it's going. Would love to um, get a glimpse of your experience. Um, right, before we get started, um, as always, the Books and Boba podcast is supported by our listeners at patreon.com slash books and boba. If you join our Patreon, you get access to not only our uh, members only Discord server, but also our monthly Boba Chat bonus podcast. So um, yeah, if you want to support us and help us cover more Asian Books by Asian and Asian American authors. Um, come join us and become a member. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. Um, as always, we start off our mid-month check-ins with 
the latest book deals from Asian and Asian American authors sourced by Rira um, from Publishers Weekly, the Internet and other sources. So to start us off, um, Rira, what is our first book deal? All right. So our first book deal is Viking acquired North American rights at an auction to We Will Go to Jinju by Grace M. Cho, whose book Tastes Like War was a National Book Award finalist and winner of the 2022 Asian Pacific American Award in Literature. Cho's upcoming nonfiction book is a reckoning with the Korean War and its ongoing impact that blends family stories, historical records, and reportage. A publication date has not been announced yet. Yeah, so um, maybe you can educate me in what what is Jinju? Jinju is a city in a southern province, and um, I'm trying to remember if there was any, like... I, I know that there were like a lot of sieges from Japanese forces back in like the 1500s. My my history is very shaky, you guys. Um, but yeah, like it's a nonfiction book, so it's not like Pachinko. It's not it's not fiction. It's not a family saga. But it sounds really interesting. Um, obviously, like. As a Korean American, like a lot of uh, war details have kind of, you know, been lost (laughs) between generations, Uh, even though like my grandparents were, um, you know, serving in the Korean War. I don't really know much about it. I've only heard about it from like American veterans and maybe like stuff that I've seen in documentaries. But obviously, like that's not enough. So I hopefully I'll probably pick up this book just to brush up on my history. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe, but the Korean War was not that long ago. Those those scars and those traumas are still very, very recent. And um, especially um, in in those immigrant communities, right? Yeah, I do know that Jinju is like really well known for bibimbap. <laughs> <laughs> I only know this because I had a friend who went to Korea fairly recently and she was like, I went to a random place in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in, in, in Jinju just to have bibimbap with my broken Korean. And I'm like, girl, it's bibimbap. I, like, how special can it be? <laughs> I don't know. Now I kind of want to try it. Like, congrats yeah. to uh, Grace on the book deal. Um, next up, another deal from Viking. Uh, Viking acquired North American rights to two books from Ruth Ozeki, The Typing Lady and To Live For Now. The former is a surreal collection of short stories, while the latter is a novel set in Japan's tumultuous Taisho era that weaves a vivid tapestry of love, loss, and political radicalism in a country on the brink of war. The Typing Lady is expected to publish in fall 2025 and to live for now to follow in 2027. Uh, Taisho era. Um, I think that's before the Meiji era. I Again, Japanese history, not my forte. <laughs> Yeah, it's um I googled it and it's the era that spanned from 1912 to 1926. Okay, so um, definitely so, like... Yeah. So pre-World War II. This is probably post Meiji era then, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's post Meiji era. Yeah. Okay. See, there you go. I my <laughs> history is very shaky, but to yeah, be this fair, is the era... I'm not Japanese. So <laughs> Yeah, this is the era that the anime Demon Slayer takes place in. I've never watched Demon Slayer, so I can't um I can't contribute. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we've read Ruth, Ruth Ozeki's book, Tale for the Time Being, for Book Club. Uh, so if you guys are interested in listening to that discussion episode, it was a while ago. So <laughs> you guys will have to go back uh, quite a bit. Uh, but Ruth Ozeki is uh, very well known. I know her book. Um, what is it? The My, My Year of Meats was really popular. And I know... Um, the Book of Form and Emptiness was also really popular. She is a very well-known author. So, Yeah. Um, congrats to Ruth on, on continuing her prolific writing career. All right. So next up, Dial acquired world rights to Tea is Love, written by Adib Koram and illustrated by Hannah Cha. A meditation on the global history and tradition of tea, the picture book also celebrates the ways that tea's warmth can connect us to our culture, our neighbors, our loved ones, and ourselves. Publication is slated for fall 2025. Tea is love. I do agree. Love a good tea. Tea is... I I think (laughs) about, like, how British people, they, you know, they're considered to be the forefront of tea, like, afternoon tea culture. Like, when you think of British people, you think of tea... And I'm like, that tea 
came from our country. <laughs> yeah, they stole it from they us. They colonized hope. us. Yeah. yeah, do you think this book will cover the colonial and imperial history? It should. Because it definitely tea should. is literally the reason why they wanted to own all of our countries. Uh, but Adib Koram is the author of Darius the Great is Not Okay, which was a previous book club pick. It was actually one of my favorite uh, book club picks. So, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely go check out that book if you guys are looking for something to read this holiday. Yeah, and always down for people to develop a, a better appreciation of tea. Um, okay, next up, Viking Bought World Rights to Mustafa Smithai, written by Sana Rafi and illustrated by Nabi H. Ali. Um, the picture book is about a boy who loves the delicious treats he has on happy occasions, so he finds a reason to celebrate every day and have some Mithai. Publication is slated for summer 2025. This is very relatable. Um, it's like, um, not to bring about Thanksgiving, but um, the best part about Thanksgiving turkey, uh, at least for me and my wife, it is the um, days of leftover sandwiches we get to have afterwards. So, you know, I find any chance to just roast the turkey so we can have those delicious sandwiches afterwards. Do you have any celebratory snacks that you like um, to eat? Just for Thanksgiving or just holidays in, in general, terms of holidays like... in general? I like songpyeon, which I haven't been able to eat in the last like three uh, three chuseoks because they're always freaking sold out and I don't want to make my own. <laughs> but I, I think it's really relatable for kids to be like, I want to celebrate this holiday every day because I get like a special sweet. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, fair. I mean, that's like Halloween, you know, I'm still eating the candy <laughs> that I, I bought for myself. Like we did not have trick or treaters. Um, so I'm like, yeah, like I get to eat a piece of candy every single day because <laughs> this Halloween pack is is endless. All right. So our next book deal is Andrew McMeal Publishing has acquired world English rights to Guy Copsumbutt's early reader graphic novel series called Badge Quest. Pillow, a young bear knight in training, teams up with Faye, a fun-loving shape-shifting fairy, to complete good deeds to earn Badges for pillow and petals on Faye's flower wand. Publication will start in fall 2025. This so sounds it's kind cute. of like kind Boy of like, Scout, Girl Scout. Yeah. It reminds me of um, Russell from Up. Oh, Russell from Up, the <laughs> best character. Yes. Yeah. Actually, no, the best character is the dog. I forgot the dog's name. Was was the dog named Doug? Or am I remembering? Oh, it might have been Doug, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was never a Boy Scout, but I definitely relate to the, um, the sense of satisfaction for getting like a badge for something. It's like playing video games, getting those. those I was about to say, it's right? like playing video <laughs> games. It's like playing Pokemon and you want to get all of the badges yeah. and complete all of the quests. I think that is the closest I'll ever get to from like <laughs> to the Boy Scout, Girl Scout experience because I, I did not have that growing up. Right. So, Say what you will yeah. about how corporate America has perverse the idea of gamification um, to ruin all of our lives. But gamification does work it does feel good to have to get achievos so um yeah congrats to um guy for the book deal next up harper collins bought author illustrator leanne cho's pick town party the picture book follows a girl who receives a mysterious invite to pick town and follows the trail into a secret world of pigs where epic parties chase scenes and a cake heist will soon unfold publication is set for fall 2025 man pick town sounds pretty dope Sounds very chaotic, indeed. <laughs> I do love that it's like a town of pigs where they just have chaotic parties because, you know, pigs get a bad rap, in, especially in like Western media. They're always like portrayed as lazy and dirty. But, you know, pigs are pretty cool. Pigs are very, very cute. And uh, you know what I was thinking when I when you were reading the book deal? You know that meme of the of the pig that like sticks out the window with like pinwheels going like we Yeah, from the Geico <laughs> like, commercial, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the type of pig that I imagine um who would like inhabit pig town. Yeah. Sounds like sounds like a fun town. <laughs> Good times. All right, next book deal, Candlewick bought world rights to A Humbug for Hana, written by Corena D. Roma Howley and illustrated by Jamie Kim. 
And it is a story about a girl who must find new ways to celebrate Chuseok after her family moves from a bustling city neighborhood to a small town. Publication is set for fall 2026. Oh, man, that sounds sad. I mean, I imagine it's like going from a place where you don't have to worry about identity to a place where you're constantly worrying about identity. I'm guessing that this is a town in America. Because like in Korea, like for Chuseok, everyone <laughs> goes to like the countryside. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can I feel like I can relate to this because uh, like I have lived in Korean dominated communities before and Chuseok has been like a very big holiday in like Korean schools but then you like move to a town where it's not so much of a holiday thing and it's just your family celebrating it and you're like our family consists of four people this is yeah. not really <laughs> well all of a sudden you're in charge of educating your entire class or community about your heritage which you know some people might like but I find very tiring. Yeah, and uh, handbooks are quite expensive. So I wonder if that's going to be like a factor in the story, being like, oh, like <laughs> I would like a handbook to celebrate Chuseok, but um, no one's going to wear a handbook in the small town, and also it is very expensive. Yeah. So who knows? All right. Next up, Red Comet Press has acquired Aloha Everything by debut author Kaylin Milia George and debut illustrator May Waite. Um, a picture book that started as a Kickstarter campaign. The book features a narrative poem set in the Hawaiian Islands about a girl who learns about the history, nature, and legends of the islands through the Hawaiian tradition of hula. Publication is set for spring 2024. Yeah, it's like really nice that this book is um, going to go into traditions that, <laughs> I mean, like, listen, I feel like Hawaii has become a thing in in American culture where we don't really know much about like hula ex other than like the exotification of it. So it's nice that we have a book that actually goes into like tradition. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, you mentioned that it's Indigenous Day coming up and definitely we can stand to learn more about the Indigenous traditions um, of the land that we live in. Um, it's the least we can do as like people who also settled here, you know? Yeah. All right, next up, HarperCollins acquired world rights to three picture books to launch the Everlasting Tales Collection, a series focused on publishing multicultural folk tales and fairy tales retold for a modern audience. Uh, the first, which is set for fall 2024, is Chang'e on the Moon by Katrina Moore and illustrated by Cornelia Lee, which follows the legend of one of China's most celebrated figures, the Moon Goddess. And the next book, The Salt Princess by Anusha Saeed, is set for winter 2025 and tells the tale of a Pakistani princess whose smart mouth leads her into trouble. And the third book, The Huntsman and the Witches, is by debut author Abraham Matthias and illustrator Molly Mendoza, which is set for summer 2025 and is a Mexican tale about an overeager hunter who unknowingly enters a cabin full of witches. You know, it's about time these publishing companies realize that there are a vast number of stories outside of Western folktales that they can, you know, I guess, exploit for for their I'm going to um, give credit where it's books. due because I feel like the last couple of years we have been seeing more folktales, more anthologies on uh, Asian fairy tales and folktales. Um, and it's but, you know, obviously we could always use more because... <laughs> Listen, like growing up, I like I only knew maybe like three Korean folktales. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's nice to have more diversity. And, you know, it's great for parents because um, once they run out of bedtime stories, they can start <laughs> uh, expanding, expanding yeah. their bookshelf. I had actually a couple volumes of a bilingual collection of Chinese folktales. So um, Tanga and the Moons actually was actually one of the stories that that was featured there because it's a very well-known story. It was actually adapted in animated form on a, I think it was a Netflix film a couple years ago. But um, yeah, it's really cool to see um, more people take on telling, retelling the story for, for today's children. All right. Next up, in a five house auction, HarperCollins won Arvin Amadi's YA Books, If You're Reading This, I'm Dead, and The Comment Section. In the first novel, a teen boy obsessed with preparing for his eventual death is caught unaware when a near death experience triggers the accidental release of his death capsule. Love letters, vengeful notes, and funeral plans, and all. 
The second novel is a dual POV murder mystery with two teens searching for a missing friend by following a digital trail that leads them abroad. Publication is set for summer 2025 and summer 2026. Okay, let me just say the second book, comment section, definitely my jam. (laughs) I love the fact that it's about two friends who are kind of playing internet sleuths to find their missing friend because I... As someone who is who is very obsessed with true crime and um, pretty much gossip as well, have gone like deep diving into into the internet to to find people. Rira, so you should know relatable. better. You should never read the comment section, except oh, maybe the but... comment section by <laughs> by Arvind Hamadi. Um, yeah, sounds like a pretty. Pretty cool modern thriller um, using like, you know, um, kind of reminds me of Missing and Searching, the two movies. Searching, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and the first book sounds really cool, too. It's like to all the boys, but like a little darker. A, a lot darker. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not about like love letters. It's about, you know, it's about death and funeral plans. It's pretty dark. However, I will yeah. say that teenagers, they are kind of obsessed with death. I don't know. It has something to do with like us being young and feeling like we'll I mean, live forever. And that's like the different. I mean, but it is about love letters because he gets to send out all the things he wants to say, but can't gets prematurely sent out to everyone because they think he's dead. I love how he it includes vengeful notes because <laughs> I am definitely like the petty type of person who would. I would probably do that uh, for like my last will and testament. Yeah. All right, next up, in a six-figure deal, FSG acquired world rights at auction to Michelle Jing Chan's debut graphic novel, Somewhere in the Gray. The book follows a girl who is dating the most popular girl at school, and what seems easy for her friends, being intimate in any way with their partners, doesn't feel quite right to her as she learns it's more than okay to live somewhere in the gray of asexuality. Publication is scheduled for fall 2026. This sounds awesome. More books on, you know, exploring sexuality and asexuality. I feel like we haven't really been seeing a lot of uh, asexual books in in the queer literature space. So this is great. Yeah, it's always cool to see uh, more identities and more sexualities and more more representation being included in in major publishing deals because I think, you know, as always, we're 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 very pro let's just get everyone's stories out there because you never know who's out there who needs to see something like this uh, to, you know, validate their own experiences, right? That means a lot, especially to um, people who are part of marginalized communities within marginalized communities even. Yeah, and I think people really forget that, you know, you can be in a relationship and not be sexually intimate. Everybody's relationship to their partner can be different. So yeah, I like really like the fact that uh, this book explores asexuality in a romantic relationship. All right, next up, Tilbury House bought world rights to Inside the Compost Bin, a debut picture book by master composter Melody Samawang Plan and illustrated by Rong Pham and Vin Nguyen. The book is a nonfiction work about the science of composting and the benefits to critters and plants. Publication is set for summer 2024. I am not a composter, yeah. so this will be a very educational <laughs> read for me. <laughs> like, right, composting is something I really should be doing. Um, I mean, we, we live in LA. We know so many people who actually like compost, but I like I'm definitely not one of those people. I yeah, feel so guilty. I feel like um, I know in the Bay Area, some people have like government supplied composting bins, and I feel like we need one of those to like encourage me to throw my food waste in there um although we do separate our food waste so i I'm, maybe my mother-in-law does compost and i just don't know about it i mean it helps now that they have like fancy composting machines that are portable and you could just put it in your house and just it'll, it'll just do everything for you but yeah. um yeah i am not a composter so i i'm probably gonna learn yeah. a lot from reading we this definitely book. need this book <laughs> Children definitely need this book because our planet is dying. So (laughs) please save us. (laughs) All right. Next up, Disney Hyperion bought at auction Dream Slinger, the start of a middle grade fantasy series by Gracie Kim. Pitched as X-Men meets Pokemon, it tells the story of 14-year-old Aria Love, who was born with a genetic mutation that turns her dreams into real-life superpowers. Her fight to find her place in the world and in her family leads her to the Royal League of Dreamslingers, but 
To be accepted as one of them, she must survive a competition that puts her powers to the ultimate test. Publication is set for spring 2025. So Gracie Kim is one of the Kim Chingus, uh, <laughs> who is the author of the Last Fallen Star series. Um, and she is a Kiwi author as well. So very, very fun. Um, yeah. I'm really glad that her new series is also fantasy. <laughs> sounds. Yeah, I was trying to parse the X-Men meets Pokemon. And I, I think it's mutant superpowers meets competition right um i think it's the the whole tournament part of it right that yeah that's the royal Pokemon. <laughs> league parts the the elite four <laughs> yeah this sounds this sounds like a lot of fun. i always love a good asian inspired take on existing stories but a whole like fantasy concept um built from scratch is also really exciting and i'm really glad like authors like gracie kim are given the 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 latitude to really um stretch their their creative powers all right, our last book deal for November. Um, Harper Collins Alita bought at auction world rights to Made for More, written by Chloe Ito Ward and illustrated by Gail Avery. Um, the picture book draws on the creators' lives in Hawaii that speaks to the journey of immigration, loving one's skin, and how scars, freckles, and color share a story about who we are, where we're from, and where we've been. Publication is slated for winter 2025. Yay, another book about Hawaii. Yeah. And also, I love how this is a book about like loving your skin, because I feel like in specifically Asian culture, we're so obsessed with having pale skin and freckles are considered bad. But I love the fact this is a story about you know embracing those things yeah and also another story that illustrates the multifaceted nature of hawaii like um the last book we covered was about indigenous stories and this one focuses on um hawaii's identity as a multicultural place with a lot of different immigrant communities um which is another major part of the hawaiian story as well so congrats to chloe and gael on the book deal yeah well, that is a wrap on our book deals, and we are going to move into our book news segment. So our first piece of news is a follow-up to uh, our last book news episode. Scholastic reversed their decision to segregate their optional collection of books about LGBTQIA characters and Black characters in their elementary school book fairs. So it was like maybe like a week later after they announced that they're going to have like this special collection for diverse books that schools can opt in and out of. And they're like, ooh, this is not a good decision <laughs> after literally every single person in, in the education and uh, publish publishing industry was like, yeah, yeah, dog, this is this is not OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like for listeners who did not check in last month, Scholastic made tweaks to their annual book fair this year, creating a whole separate book fair section that includes all of their, I guess, quote unquote, diverse titles that was optional for schools to participate in. And um, you can check in last month to hear our incredulous thoughts, but it was the world hasn't gone so far to like make this okay. And I'm glad I'm glad to see that like they did reverse their their decision, even though they shouldn't have done it in the first place, right? Like it was a move made yeah, out of I mean, the reason why they did it in the first place is because of all the book ban c campaigns from conservative parents, and it's like you guys are scholastic. You guys are a multi million dollar company like surely like why are you scared like yeah use your power and money to fight the book ban like, and it kind of on. illustrates the short-sightedness of corporations and their like their legal departments not realizing that a vocal minority is still a minority and it doesn't make sense to capitulate to a minority, right? Like, even though they had some victories in their, like, conservative districts, the vast majority of the country does not agree and thinks it's a dumb idea. So I think hopefully this will ser serve as a good lesson to them not to be so reactionary and to actually, you know, do their jobs and be a leader in the industry and, like, kind of stand up for what's right. I'm especially proud of the kids who protested this decision by Scholastic because literally they were like, what else are we going to read? We've literally read all of the white character books that have been okayed by our school. Like, we literally have nothing else to read. So 
you know, this decision is very stupid. Yeah. I had like, I, I like laughed so hard when, <laughs> when, when I read some of like the Gen Z, Gen Alpha uh, comments to this decision by Scholastic. So uh, good on them. And uh, hopefully they don't do dumb decisions like this in, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Yeah, someone needs to be in the room to tell them, like, yo, this is this is dumb. Yeah, someone needs to tell them diversity is not a choice. Uh, it is a reality. So suck it up and just, you know, <laughs> suck do it up job. and do your job. Yeah. <laughs> do your job. All right, so our next piece of news is that the Goodreads Choice Awards uh, ditched a couple of key categories. Uh, they ditched the children's and middle grade poetry and graphic novel categories and they added the new category of romanticy and a lot of people are pissed on book twitter wait so they ditched the very real genres of children's and middle grade poetry and graphic novel in favor of including a made-up new category i mean romanticy is not a made-up category it is like a valid category but i like They got rid of three major categories, like not a single children's book or middle grade novel is included in in like their annual Goodreads Choice Awards. Um, And like the fact that they got rid of poetry is is also like very alarming. Um, Yeah, like what the hell, Goodreads? Like who (laughs) thought this was a good idea? You have so many middle grade authors who are so mad right now. I mean... As if we don't need more reasons to not like good reason what they do. Um, this is like this is pretty tone deaf, I feel like. Yeah. Especially as um, like a platform. Like they're trying to be the the platform for like books. And they have been the platform, if not for lack of choice. And so this is um this is yeah, this is kind of baffling. The fact that graphic novels was also left out. I'm like, this is a huge category. I feel like there have been more graphic novels in the last like three years. Um what are you guys doing? And um, what is it? The author of Squire, which is our book club pick of this month, actually commented on this and said, Squire would not have been able to be a Goodreads Choice Awards nominee if it got published this year instead of 2022. Children and middle grade and graphic novel readers are among the most vocal and passionate ones out there. This is such a disservice. And I completely agree. Yeah. It's quite BS. Um, and, you know, not not dissing so much on romanticy, but that's like two different categories, you know? Like, they can be <laughs> in romance and fantasy. I don't think they needed to, like, combine it to separate well, I mean, fantasy th- books with romantic elements <laughs> in them. Because I feel like a lot of those books do have very big world buildings. And it, I don't know, it just kind of does a disservice to be like, oh, yeah. it's... More or f- romance and fantasy. Yeah. And you can also very well add this category while also keeping those other categories too. Like I, I, I'm i reading the rationale that they want to like be more relevant, but I don't see how this is helping their cause. Like isn't being more relevant being more inclusive and like not excluding whole swaths, like a whole like, like not even genre, but a whole category of books. The fact that this is you know, an audience choice awards, I, I just find it really baffling that they got rid of like three major categories. Yeah. It's not like the National Book Awards where, you know, like it's like it's voted by a committee. It's, you know, it's literally like a fan choice awards and you got rid of three major categories that fans actually really enjoy reading. It reeks of a decision made from like interpreting data. Maybe they saw that people who read middle grade poetry and graphic novel aren't on Goodreads and aren't commenting on Goodreads. But at the same time, like if you're trying to be like a definitive like prestigious award you want to you want to be the one in like all categories right so it just doesn't make sense nope absolutely not <laughs> but speaking of national book awards it happened last night in new york and we have some congratulations to give out so dan santat's middle grade graphic memoir of first time for everything won the young people's literature award and City Lights bookseller Paul Yamazaki accepted the Literarian Award for Outstanding Contribution to the American Literary Community. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, congratulations to Dan and Paul. 
Um, I know in our last book news episode, we listed all of the Asian finalists. So there were quite a few. So um, check out those finalists as well. Um, I'm really glad that we had like a like an independent bookseller get this really prestigious award. Yeah. City Lights Bookseller looks like it's a bookstore in San Francisco. So gotta gotta check that out next time in, I'm in town. But also congrats to Dan. Um, sorry you can't win a Goodreads Choice Award though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've met Dan a couple of times uh, because he's uh, local to my local bookstore. Nice. And he's great. He's great. <laughs> and um, he's written a lot of great kids books. So I'm really glad that... Um, he he won for for such a personal work too because it's it's a graphic memoir. Yeah. All right. So our next piece of news is that we need diverse books, which you know very familiar organization in this podcast. Uh, they debuted a new website called Indigenous Reads Rising (IRR) for short. IRR is designed to insist on educators to incorporate more books by Native authors and illustrators, as well as provide resources, grants, and mentorships for Native writers and illustrators. This has been a long time coming. I mean, 2%, I think it's like less than 2% um, of the publishing industry has books by Native and Indigenous authors. So it is really nice that there is... Um, like a platform for Native and Indigenous authors and illustrators, especially those who are like not published yet. They they have like a way for them to get into the industry. So good on We Need Diverse Books to to set up this yeah. Um, chapter. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned this earlier in, during the book deals, but having books centering Indigenous stories, especially in, in America and for younger readers, is really important for us to not only developing understanding of like of those stories um, for, for the next generation, but also, you know, helping to, you know, diversity. We, our podcast focuses a lot on Asian storytellers, but at the same time, we also, you know, it's always cool when we read stories about Indigenous um, communities um, in America and abroad as well. So I think just understanding like the world is a complicated place and, you know, it's been irrevocably changed by colonization and immigration and globalization. And so it's even more important to really think about our role in all that, you know, um, as immigrants, as settlers, or even as indigenous people living amongst settlers to like get a better understanding of like how everything fits, right? And let's hope that these future books by Native and Indigenous authors are included in future scholastic book fairs (laughs) at elementary schools. Yeah. All right. So our our last piece of news, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, Time released their annual list of 100 must-read books. And for their list this year, 2023... Um, They had a handful of books by Asian authors, so I'm just going to go list them. A Living Remedy by Nicole Chung, Ghost Music by An Yu, The Great Reclamation by Rachel Heng, Greek Lessons by Han Kang, The Hive and the Honey by Paul Yoon, Holding Pattern by Jenny She, Let's Go, Let's Go, Let's Go by Cleo Chan, Mott Street by Ava Chin, Owner of a Lonely Heart by Beth Wen. Waiting to be Arrested at Night by Tahir Hamoud Izgil. Wandering Souls by Cecile Pin. What You Are Looking For Is In the Library by Michiko Aoyama. Y slash N by Esther Yi. And Yellowface by R.F. Kwong. Yeah, we've had a couple of these authors on the podcast. Like we covered not Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong, but we covered her um, previous book, Babel. Um, Yellow Face, of course, is her latest novel that I'm really excited to read. Um, it's actually available on the Spotify Premium if you have on audiobook if you if you have a Spotify Premium account. So that might be the way that I listen to the book. Um, and the Great Reclamation by Rachel Hang. Uh, we had her on the podcast for a previous author chat um, about her epic historical fiction about um, the development of Singapore as as an island nation. So that's pretty cool too. I'm pretty excited to read Y slash Ed by Esther Yee because it is about uh, a fanfic author in the K-pop community who <laughs> like kind of gets obsessed and it's it just sounds like a lot of fun. Um, 
really happy that so many uh, Asian and Asian American authors made it onto this list. Um, hopefully, they get more uh, readers this way since time, you know, advocated for these books. Yeah. Also glad to have some more books to add to our potential future book club pick list because Rita and I always have a, have a tough time um, trying to figure out what books to read next. Yeah, it's always a lot of like mental gymnastics for me <laughs> being like, did we read this genre this month? Like, did we read too many books by East Asian authors? You guys, like I really put a lot of thought into it, <laughs> which is why I'm so glad that our Honey Boba members uh, have alleviated this burden <laughs> by um, voting like, for our quarterly picks. Because yeah. that just means that I have less books to <laughs> to to figure out for our book club to read. Yeah. Um, but with that, that'll do it for this mid-month check-in. Um, we were, as always, thank you for compiling all the book publication, all, all the book and publication news uh, for this episode. As always, you can, you can support us at Books and Boba by um, either becoming a member of our Patreon or by uh, making a purchase on our online bookstore or merch store. Uh, you can check those out at booksandboba.com. Um, but yeah, before we go, um, Rira, remind us what we are reading for book club for um, November 2023. So we are reading Squire by Nadia Shamas and Sarah Alfagi, and it is set in an alternative West Asia, and the graphic novel follows 14-year-old Isa, who trains to become a knight for a war-torn empire while trying to hide her true background as a girl from conquered lands. Yeah, I'm having a really great time reading through it. Um, it's a lot thicker than I thought it would be, so um, you know, it's literally a novel length, so definitely budget some time to get through it. But if you finish Squire and want to share your thoughts, please let us know either on Goodreads or on our Discord server if you are a Patreon um, supporter. As always, we'd love to include your thoughts on our book club discussions uh, whenever possible. Um, But with that, um, that'll do it for this episode. Um, Thanks so much for joining us. And yeah, we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, I'm Phil Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community, bringing in guests who are shaping and informing this thing called Asian America from Hollywood to D.C. and beyond. Uh, We've got media, entertainment, food, family, politics, representation, the good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. Peace. Peace.